Shabbat Shalom. Welcome to Betarial Messianic Congregation. I don't know if you noticed in the back of the bulletin, you have all the uh, ministries actually that are listed. And uh, you know that you have uh, over 20 of them. And I want to encourage you to uh, work, to come and produce fruits for the Lord. You can choose your ministry. If you're interested, you can come and see uh, one of the elder. Uh, one of the elders. So we have the Jericho ministry. You know what this is? That's the sound ministry. We have the uh, trumpet ministry. That is the radio ministry. It's working. You know, well. You have the Abrahamic ministry. What do you think it is? It's the welcome ministry, right? You see when Abraham welcomed God into his home. You have also the upper room ministry. What did they do in the upper room? They actually spoke in tongues. So you have the translation ministry. <laughs> you have also the uh, Abigail ministry. You know, what did Abigail do? She fed the army of, of uh, D uh, David, right? This is the kitchen ministry. You have also the Davidic ministry, which is the prayer ministry. Uh, you have the Galilean ministry. Now, the Galilean ministry, who served breakfast to the disciples? Jesus. So that's actually the men's breakfast ministry. And tomorrow we're having a men's breakfast, and... It's Gabe who's going to uh, serve us our, uh, actually, our breakfast. And you're welcome, but not all, but all the men, right? You can come. Uh, it'll be in my place. Uh, you have also the Levite ministry, which is the teaching ministry. Uh, you have the Berean ministry at the back, right? They're selling books. That's the book table ministry. The angelic host ministry, the bulletin ministry. I love these names. You know why? Because they, they, they you know... It's, they bring me to, to want to partake to all of them, really. And you have also the, the, the Aquila and Priscilla ministry. That is the couples ministry and so on, so on. So I encourage you to really get in there and maybe there's something uh, for you to do. So let's open up now our scriptures to Numbers chapter 4. Our chapter today brings us inside the tabernacle of God. The place where he said he dwelt among men. Now, the access into this tent is extraordinarily difficult, even impossible. For the greater majority of men, to get in there was almost, again, impossible. In chapter 2 and 3, we have seen how the 600,000 soldiers from the 12 tribes of Israel surrounded and protected this structure. Then we, see, we, we saw how a, a, another group of 8,580 Levites form another defense around it, not counting the priests, the sons of Aaron, who stood at the door of the tent. And then even for the priests, the access is still very limited. For only one of the priests, the high priest, the Kohen Hagadol, and only once a year could enter the Holy of Holy, a small room deep inside the tabernacle where the Ark of the Covenant rested, a symbol of God's footstool, not his throne and where are found two carved angels bowing his feet. So far, all of this is not very encouraging. The access to God, the God of the Bible, seems so restrained. It is practically unattainable. And because of the three or so million Israelites who are on the move in the wilderness, this chapter describes to us how these 8,580 Levites with the priests work together to dismantle and carry the tabernacle to another destination. A very delicate move for each item is considered so holy. But they were so organized and worked in such an impressive and efficient way. And notice that it is a lot of people for such a relatively small unit. You know, the tabernacle itself was about 14 meter by 5 meter wide and 5 meter high. Every one of these thousands of Levites had a specific assigned task to accomplish at a specific time in the process. Each is told how to handle each item and with which color coverings to blanket them and how to carry them. But what are we to understand in all of this complicated setup? Why is it so elaborate? Why is it so intricate? You know, reading all these details may be very tedious and tiresome. However, however, this is the word of God, right? However, this is where the chapter opens up. For it is in these details that the message of hope is concealed, but not hidden, especially for the believers today. Last week we began to see that in front of the 
the only door to the tabernacle stood the tribe of Judah, and we remember Jacob's prophecy that the Messiah was to come from this tribe, as if it stood right there waiting for the Messiah to come in and open the way for us to God. Today, as our chapter brings us right inside the tabernacle, we will see that every one of these holy items speak and point to Yeshua. We may not have yet deciphered the message behind each of these elements. I'm sure that it will not do it on this side of heaven, right, or of the universe. But enough is given for us to marvel and to thank God who never really closed the way to heaven, for there's a path there. There's a path to consider, and I believe that the Old Testament saints, many of them, discovered the message then in the first four chapters of Numbers reveals to us that it is not true that the way of God is impossible and shut down. On the contrary, it is wide open for anyone who really, really wants to come to him. The Messiah is waiting for us in the tabernacle, so let us go in there and begin our treasure hunt. Because it's really a treasure hunt. Let's read the first three, uh, the first three opening verses <clears throat> of chapter 4. It says, Then the Lord spoke to Moses and Aaron, saying, Take a census of the sons of Kohath from among the children of Levi by their families, by their father's house. From 30 years old and above, even to 50 years old, all who entered the service to do the work in the tabernacle of meeting. Now this census concerns the Levites who were from 30 years old to 50 years old. In the previous census, all the Levites were to be counted from one month old and above. This is found in chapter 3, verse 15. Now it is from 30 years old to 50 years old because this is the workforce. The workforce. 30 years old is the beginning of their ministry, the age of strength and wisdom. These were to carry the holy, that is, items, and sometimes they were heavy objects. And there was no room for mistakes. And in number 8, they are told to begin at the age of 25, by the way. Seeing the importance of the work, they begin their training five years earlier. Now, 30 is a very significant age in the scriptures. Who began his ministry at the age of 30? Yeshua himself began his ministry when he was 30 years old. This was stamped by his baptism, which was done by a descendant of Aaron, John the Baptist. It is then that Yeshua began his ministry of salvation. And then two other people in the Old Testament began their ministries at the age of 30. Two who actually typify the Messiah so well. The first one, Joseph. He was 30 years old when he stood before Pharaoh. There he also began his ministry of saving the Egyptians and the nations around and also his people Israel. He himself was a type of the Messiah. And another type of the Messiah, the strong one. David was 30 years old when he began to reign as king in an attempt to establish the kingdom so the Israelites would be the light of the nations. However, the full meaning of this number 30 began when Yeshua began his ministry. Then he fulfilled every item of the tabernacle. And the number 30 itself is a product of 10 and 3. The number 10 is seen as, as signifying the perfection of divine order or completeness of order, like the Ten Commandments, which sums up for us the 603 other commandments in the Torah, or the Ten Plagues, which shows God's complete victory over the false gods. And the number 3 is the number of the Trinity, showing the highest degree of perfection of divine order as marking the right time, the perfect moment in the number 30. So these Levites could begin their work at the age of 30. Yeshua actually came to fulfill it later. And furthermore, the census spoken in verse 2 begins with the works of the son of Kohath. Kohath. You can see them. They are right at the bottom in here. Now the Korathites were the ones who only carried the items inside and outside the holy place and the holy of holies. However, they did not do anything else. For the dismantlement and covering of these items was done by the priest. No ordinary Levite was to see any of these items and covered. Otherwise, he would be put to death. 
After the end of the census, God reminds Moses and Aaron to make sure that all the items were well covered. Well covered. Look at verse 18 and 19. He says to them, do not cut off the tribe of the families of the Kohathites from among the Levites. But do this in regard to them, that they may live and not die when they approach the most holy things. Now who wants to be a Kohathite? Right? Their job was the most dangerous of all the jobs in Israel. But here again, the emphasis is on the difficulties of approaching God in the way anyone sees fit. God was teaching them that there's only one way to God again. Only one way to worship Him. In many ways, believers are all corthized in their handling of the sacred things of the Lord. But now under the protection of Yeshua, who took on himself all the punishment contained in the Mosaic law, we are freer. But still, it is a heavy thing to carry the things of the Lord and to bring it to the nation. Let us now see how the things of the Holy of Holies and the Holy Place in the tabernacle were being prepared for the journey. Here we'll begin to find the keys that will help us to unfold this complexity and open the doors to see the salvation that God had prepared from thousands of years before. Let's begin again to see verse 4 to 6. Now that is the service of the sons of Kohath in the tabernacle of meeting relating to the most holy things. When the camp prepares to journey, Aaron and his sons shall come and they shall take down the covering veil and cover the ark of the testimony with it. Then they shall put on it a covering of tahash and spread over that a cloth entirely of blue and they shall insert its poles. Now there's a lot of things in there. This passage begins by bringing us inside the Holy of Holies and the move begins with the veil and the Ark of the Testimony, which we have right in here, in the Holy of Holies. This is the Ark and it had to move. Now before the work of the Kohath begins, the sons of Aaron the priests would come and begin to dismantle it and see how they do it. They will first remove the veil and cover it, cover the Ark with it. It must have been done in such a way that none of the priests would see the Ark of the Covenant. Then over the veil, they put a certain covering made of a skin of an unknown animal. We've seen that some translator called a, this animal a badger, like a badger skin, either a seal skin. But no one knows what it is except that it was an ordinary common skin with which they made sandals. We'll call it the Tahash. Now there is here something unusual. While all the other elements of the tabernacle had the tahash as their top covering, the ark was the only one with the top colorful covering. The tahash was under a blue covering. So in the procession, the Israelites will see a sea of, of, of tahash, that is ordinary, that is skin, but the only one, the only blue one, the only colorful one will be the ark. What would the message be, and why this color blue? Blue in the scripture is the color of hope, the color of the sky. This color, each Israelite, by the way, carried on himself through the tass tassels, if you remember, the tzitzit, in order to remember God who dwells in the heaven. The blue ark was then a reminder of the other world up in heaven, and also a reminder of their, the election of Israel. The reason for the tassels is given in Numbers 15.39. He says, and you shall have the tassels that you may look upon it. It was blue. And remember all the commandments of the Lord to do them. Tassels in Hebrew means twisted thread, just like we have it in the screen. There are eight threads, threads, each in the four corners, which make a total of 32, the numerical value of the heart, lev. It was thus designed so that the Israelites, each Israelite, will keep the word of God, a reminder of the word of God, a reminder of the presence of God in the heavens. And these tassels were always to be worn in the outside, by the way, always visible. In modern times, they were compelled to hide them inside because of persecution. But at the time, every Israelite, looking at them and looking at his neighbors who would carry them, would actually remember the things of God. And blue is said to be the color of the tribe of Judah. It was sky blue. This is a predominant color right at the entrance of the tabernacle. 
So the message was from Judah to the presence of God and the tzitzit was a constant reminder of this truth. And the translation in the New American Standard Bible in verse 4 verse 6 says, And it shall spread over it a cloth of pure, pure blue. Right? Pure Khalil means perfect. And this blue, the prophet tell us, surrounded the throne of God. Do you remember when Moses went to the mount? What did he see? In Exodus 24.10, And they saw the, the God of Israel, and there was under his feet, as it were, a pavement of sapphire stone like the very heaven of clearness, like the heaven, sky blue, like the color of Judah, like the color of the ark. Sapphire stone, which is a Hebrew word, by the way, comes from all shades of blue today, but according to the Midrash rabbi, even according to Exodus, it is light blue. And Ezekiel saw the same thing in heaven in Ezekiel 1. He says, and about the firmament over the heads was the likeness of a throne, in appearance like a sapphire stone. On the likeness of a throne was a likeness with the appearance of a man high above it. He saw the Messiah. This is what the covering of the tabernacle reminds us today, a representation of the throne of heaven. Remember from the Gospel of Matthew that Jesus wore these tassels. And his powers emanated from them at some point. When that woman who had, was bearing and ostracized from the presence of God for 12 years knew that if she touched the tassels of Jesus, she would be healed. She did, and she was healed. The same type of power would come over us when we remember and meditate on God who is in heaven. Today we are free to wear tassels if we want to, but we have a much higher reminder, a more powerful one. We have whom? The Spirit of God dwelling in us and always reminding us of the things of God. It is this Spirit of God who know, now spreads this blue covering over our minds, our hearts, always pointing and always describing who Yeshua is. As it says in 1 Corinthians 2.11, For what man knows the things of a man except the spirit of man which is in him? Even so, no one knows the things of God except the spirit of God. Anything we understand is from him who dwells in us. And who carried the ark, by the way? The priest whom God sanctified for himself. Today, all believers, by the way, are called sanctified, right? We're called the saints, which means sanctified. And so we are carrying this ark as well. Now back to the ark. Why did God order that the ordinary covering, the tahash, be put in between the veil and the pure blue covering? Commentators always thought that the tahash was to protect the items from dirt during the journey, but here it is itself in between the blue covering and the veil. Could it be that the blue covering is a call to all to see the suffering Messiah, symbolized by the ordinary covering as we saw last week? For no one can come to the place of the veil without Yeshua, without salvation. The tahash was directed the directly covering the veil. And how, how did the veil look like? What kind of color was that veil? The veil itself was made of four colors, four significant colors, the same colors of the entrance of the tabernacle. You have the same colors right there. The colors are given in Exodus 26, 36. It says, you shall make a screen for the doorway of the tent of blue, purple, scarlet material, and fine-twisted linen, that's the white one, the work of a weaver. These four colors are also at the door, if you want, of the New Testament in their symbolism, in their significance. The purple is the color of the kings. This reminds, me, it reminds us of the Gospel of Matthew, which presents Yeshua as the king of the Jews, from the tahash to the purple that is a messiah. The white is the color of purity. This reminds us of the Gospel of Luke, which presents the Messiah as a man, the perfect man. The blue is the color of the sky, of the tassels, of the sapphire, of the pavement, of the throne of God in heaven. This reminds us of the Gospel of John, which presents Yeshua as the divine Son of God. The scarlet, the red color, is that of conflict, even of death. The death of the obedient servant of, of Jehovah as the Gospel of Mark presents us the Messiah of Israel. And so the four colors, which were at the door of the tabernacle, 
which are the door of the New Testament, reminds us of the gift of God, the gift of salvation we find in his son, the gift of the New Testament, which reveals and clearly reveals the Jewish Messiah to us. And notice one more thing in Numbers chapter 4, verse 6. All of the ark was to be carried and lifted up through poles. By the way, the other things as well. And look at the last word. It says, and they shall insert its poles. These poles, we are told, are made of what? Wood covered with gold. This is what it was. Here again, we can see the two nature of the Messiah, divine and human. The wood is fragile, but the gold holds it up. Jesus, by the way, is everywhere in the tabernacle to be seen. While the way to God was or seemed impossible, slowly and surely, we find the key to enter into it. And see that all this information is given to us while the Israelites were where? In the wilderness. In the wilderness. Not a nice place to be, but the best place to discover God. There's one thing I want to bring to you, something that Moses told Pharaoh, something very important, I believe, in Exodus 3.18. He says, let us go three days' journey into the wilderness that we may sacrifice, that we may worship the Lord our God. Why did he have to go to the wilderness to worship the Lord? Because, again, this is the ideal place, away from the distractions of life, to meet God. Because, you know, the religion of the Bible is a personal religion. It's a relationship religion. Moses also had to spend 40 difficult years in the wilderness as a shepherd leading his flock to these rare patches of grass before being called to lead the Israelites for 40 years in the desert. By the way, this was not wasted time. It was training time. After his conversion as well, Paul had to to go alone in Arabia for three years before he could first come back to Jerusalem and start preaching the word of God. We all need our place in the wilderness, a place of worship, a place of study of the word of God. Often when the Lord leads us there, we, we, we often misinterpret his love for us and many feel that he abandons us. But if you're a believer, let me tell you, he will never forsake you. The life of a believer is into his hand. We remember that God uses broken things to do great things, right? Broken soil to produce great crops. Broken clouds to produce rain. And then grain for food. Broken grain to produce bread. Broken bread to feed our bodies. Nothing is wasted in the life of believers when we walk with God. Now we are close to Christmas time and... We will surely hear much of Handel's great composition, The Messiah, which I love to hear. They say that when he composed it for 23 days, he completely withdrew from the things of this world. So immersed was he in his music that the food brought to him was often left untouched. Describing his feeling when the Hallelujah chorus burst on his mind, Handel said, I did think it, I, I did see all heaven before me and the great God himself. Many times in his life, the believers need to, this time out of the wilderness, to rediscover our God and compose his own Messiah song. Now before we move to the other room, the holy place, you know the Holy of Holies is actually a perfect cube, right? Perfect cube, just like the, actually the New Jerusalem, the same thing. And you know when you open up a cube, there's many ways you can open it up. When one way, when you open it up, you have a cross, right? Just like how the Israelites were around it. Now let us go forward in the text and see how these Israelites are further brought to, to see the Messiah. Let us move into the holy place now. So the next item that is mentioned, it's interesting, it's not the first, but the next is the table of showbread. Right here. Look at verse 7 and 8. So on the table of showbread, they shall spread a blue cloth and put on it the dishes, the pans, the bowls, and the pitchers for pouring, and the showbread shall be on it. They shall spread over them a scarlet cloth and cover the same with a covering of tachash skins, and they shall insert its poles. 
Now, the table of the 12 reds speak of the Messiah as the provider, as the manna, something that the Israelites were to experience very soon in the desert. The 12 breads, one for each tribe of the tribe of Israel, presents the Messiah as the bread of life. In the discussion about the Israelites in the desert found in John 6, Jesus said, he said to them, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me shall never hunger, and he who believes in me shall never thirst. And there, there must have been a constant miracle every Shabbat for the priests. Every Shabbat, by the way, they changed these 12 breads for new ones, and they were ordered to eat the old breads right there. But breads get stale and hardens after seven days, even get moldy. But surely this bread kept its freshness, and the priests were again reminded of God's presence and provision for them. Later on, iron stick was put inside the Holy of Holies, a room without any light, but the sticks budded, showing that nothing perishes when it is with God. So as the breads were covered, while the Israelites were on the move, it was Isaac Abarbanel, a Portuguese Jewish commentator from the 1400, who associated the covering of the bread during the journey to the covering of the bread during the Shabbat. You know, before the meal and the Shabbat, the bread is always covered, and then the motzi, the blessing of the bread, it is uncovered and eaten. So the Shabbat rest was a time when the Israelites were reminded of the soon coming rest of the Messianic times. Every Shabbat was like a reminder of this time in the same way that they were in their journey toward the promised land and the bread was covered as they went on. For the believers today, this table of 12 breads reminds us of the soon coming supper of the Lamb that will inaugurate the eternal Shabbat. This table of 12 breads could be seen as well as a type of our Ceremony of the breaking of bread when we get together and eat the bread and remember what Yeshua did and what he will do for us. So this table, while the first after the veil is the first, not the first after the veil, is the first one mentioned in the ark as if God is also eagerly waiting for this time when he will eat with us in the supper that would inaugurate actually the eternal state. And why was it eaten by the priests? God commanded it to show that his food was not for himself. As the pagan religions around Israel were always feeding their gods with food and sacrifices, the food and the sacrifices in the Mosaic law was not for God. It was for man, completely for man. All was for him. Now the next item they were to pack is found in verse 9 and 10. Look at what it says. And they shall take a blue cloth and cover the lampstand of the light with its lamps, its wick trimmers, its trays, and all its oil vessels with which they service it. Then they shall put it with all its utensils in the covering of tachash and put it on a carrying beam. Now the lampstand, this is what we have. By the way, in the original temple, there was only one lampstand. The lampstand, this item speaks of the service of the believers, that is, of Israel at that time. It symbolized the light of Israel, and all believers are to carry out this light to the world. It was made of gold in the form of an almond tree, the tree, by the way, of evangelism. This is how I would call it. You know, at the destruction of the first temple, Jeremiah, a descendant of Aaron, and the son of the high priest of the time, saw a vision of a broken branch of the almond tree and the entreated sash that is a belt worn by the sons of Aaron. Both mark the interruption of the service of Israel. It was the beginning of the first diaspora. Josephus himself, a Levite, tells us that this lampstand at the temple was made of 70 parts. These 70 parts brings us to think of the 70 nations mentioned in the table of the nations and also of the 70 Jews actually, that came inside, that is, uh, Egypt. And Jesus uses this symbolism of the lampstand from the temple to speak of the work of the church. Remember what he said in Revelation 2, 5? We saw this a few times. He says, remember, therefore, from where you have fallen, repent and do the work, the first works, or else I will come and quickly remove your lampstand from its place. That means he will fire the people 
or fire this church because they are not actually bringing the light into the world, just like he did for Israel for a little while. This is why there's a veil over Israel, as Paul says it. So the lampstand is a ministry of this particular church which was in danger to be removed. So let us forget that what happened to Israel, even at the time of Jeremiah, is there as a warning so that we can learn from Israel and we can actually go and produce the fruits that the Lord has prepared for us. Remember that in the 4th century BC, Plato was speaking on some of the difficult mysteries of the universe. He exclaimed, then he said, Oh, that there might come forth a word from God to make all things clear. Well, it did. It did come forth, and in a mighty way, and for thousands of years before him, and it is all compiled in the word of God, especially in the book of Numbers. And furthermore, at the same time as Plato pronounced these words, Malachi spoke of Jesus coming to the temple, and Haggai even spoke of the desired of the nations. This is how he spoke of of the Messiah. Today, anyone asking that there might come forth a word from God to make all things clear, give them the book of Numbers. Now, let us see what is next packed in the text of Numbers 4, verses 11, 12. It says, Over the golden altar there shall spread a blue cloth and cover it with a covering of badger skin, or tahash, and they shall insert its poles. And they shall take all the utensils of service with which they minister the sanctuary, put them in a blue cloth, cover them with a covering of tahash, and put them on a carrying beam. This altar is the closest to the ark. This is the golden altar, the altar of incense. And it is called the golden altar, gold, the most precious metal, then indicating the most privileged position in the holy place. Why? Because it is that of prayer. Prayer which speaks directly to God. At that time, three priests were coming into the holy place. One will clean the ashes from the previous offerings. Another would carry the coals from the altar of sacrifice outside. And then they would leave. And then the third priest will start praying. We'll start praying. This is where Zachariah, the father of John the Baptist, offered incense, and where Gabriel came to announce the birth of John. Now, the burning of the incense was done twice a day, 9 a.m. and 3 p.m., in the morning and evening sacrifice. And we learned, we've learned that it was at 9 a.m. that Yeshua was crucified, and it was at 3 p.m. that actually he died. And today it is in his name that we pray. Through his name, our prayers now even go through the universe to the throne of God because that veil, by the way, is no more. And there's one more miracle noticed by Rashi, a French rabbi from the 11th century in his commentary on Numbers. He noticed that the fire of the altar of sacrifice was to be perpetual since the fire for the first sacrifice had to come down from heaven as it did with Moses and Solomon. So he wrote that this fire was under covering. And he said, and I quote, like a lion under his cloth and not burn the covering. But this is not the only fire that was to burn perpetually. The fire of the lampstand as well. So how then did they carry these fires? We're not told. But in any case, if they carried the fire and, and they did, it was probably hidden from the side. And Rashi might be right. Here's another miracle. Now what have we learned so far? that is the tabernacle itself, the holy place, shows us the life, if you want, of the believer. We have the presence of God, and then right at the presence of God, we have prayers, we have the provision, and we have service, right? But how does one get inside the holy place to enjoy the provision, the prayer, the service, which really are for the believers? Let us move now to the outside and find the way You know, as the Spirit leads in Numbers 13 and 14. Look what it says. So also they shall take away the ashes from the altar and spread a purple cloth over it. They shall put on it all its implements with which they minister there, the fire pans, the forks, the shovels, the basins, and all the utensils of the altar, and they shall spread 
on it a covering of tahash and answer its poles. Here we are brought right at the altar standing in front of the door of the presence of God. You see how big it is? These altars, as opposed to the one inside made of gold, this one is made of bronze and wood. Here again we can see the Son of God in his suffering because bronze is a symbol of the divine judgment. This is how Jesus stands in Revelation chapter 1, with his feet full of bronze, or as bronze. And there is one special covering over this altar. Look at verse 13. It's purple, purple, white purple. That is the color of royalty and of the kings. This is, by the way, the only item covered with purple. Why is that? This color may remind us when Yeshua was crucified, the Romans gave the reason of his crucifixion, and they said, this is Jesus, the king of the Jews. This altar was there waiting for him and clothed in purple, the color of royalty, that of the king of the Jews, the king of kings. And when Yeshua was mocked by the Roman soldiers, we read in Mark 15, and they clothed him with purple, and they twisted a corn of thorn and put it on his head, and began to salute him, saying, Hey, hail, kings of the Jews. And in John, it says, Then Jesus came out wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe, and Pilate said to them, Behold, the man. But they didn't get it. This was like a prophecy about to be fulfilled. A few hours later, the altar was filled, was fulfilled, accomplished forever when Yeshua gave up his spirits. And here is the plan of salvation in the outer court. For right in front of the only door to God stood the tribe of Judah, from whom the Messiah was to come. Then right in front of the presence of God, in between the door, was the altar of sacrifice, as if to ask the person, have you accepted the Lord Jesus Christ? Do you know Jesus before you can go back and see the Lord? In fact, this altar represents the only means to approach God. This we've seen so many times in Leviticus 17.11. There we see the key of the entire mosaic law, which was by the blood of sacrifice. He says, for the life of the flesh is in the blood, and I've given it to you upon the altar to make atonement for your souls. For it's the blood that makes atonement for the souls. This is how God said it. No one could enter the presence of God without being faced with the altar of sacrifice where perpetual sacrifices were to be held, all pointed to the death and resurrection of the Messiah. It was there as if to ask every individual who was looking to approach God, what's your password? Under whose authority are you coming? This, I believe, is the message of Numbers chapter 4. And remember again the outside of the tabernacle, something we always remember at Passover. Remember the tachash, this ordinary skin they used to make sandals? The first covering of the place where God dwelt was made of tachash, as if to remind us of how we used to think of God and his offer of salvation. But come closer to the tabernacle and lift up the first covering. What would you see? A second covering, but this one is different. It was made of ram skin dyed in red to show the death of the Messiah. Why a ram? In one of the most touching stories of the Bible, the binding of Isaac, as Isaac was carrying the wood on his shoulder, he asked his father, Abba, where's the lamb? What did God provide? That ram, that ram. And God said, God will provide. Jehovah Jireh. The lamb was to come. The ram prefigured the coming of the Messiah. The lamb symbolized the Messiah. And did you know that in the book of Revelation, the book of the victory of the Messiah, Jesus is called the Lamb 27 times. 27 times. You cannot detach the first coming and the second coming. It's all in one. And this skin is hidden from view. You need to go and lift up the first covering just like you need to go to the Word of God and open it. And God, the Spirit of God, will reveal these things to you. But for those who, who persist, there's a third covering. This third one was made of a simple ram skin, not dyed, just with, in its natural color, as if the ram rose from the dead as Yeshua resurrected. And before he went to heaven, he spent three days and three nights in Sheol. And 
from where he took the believers with him. He went there for us. And if you further persist in knowing more about the Messiah and not stop at any of these three coverings, but you go to the fourth one, the fourth covering will be shown to you, one which speaks of Yeshua in heaven preparing the place for you. This fourth covering was in blue, in purple, and in red. Remember the blue over the ark, which spoke of heaven, the red of his suffering, the purple of the color of royalty. Here is the Messiah sitting on his throne in all his glory. And this covering was made of fine, expensive linen embroidered with cherubim, symbolizing the angelic presence worshiping the Messiah. And this last covering was visible from the inside, but not from the outside. This is why people need to come to God, make that effort to open up the scriptures, to pray, and to ask God to come into their hearts. Today there's no tabernacle, but we have the scriptures where we get all our information from. Like the first covering of the tabernacle, the Bible may be seen old, outdated, but let the Lord lead you to lift up the first covering, the second, the third, and the fourth, and come into his presence. Some of you remember Aesop's great fable about the crow, the crow that is, who was out in the wilderness, and he was very thirsty. He had not had anything to drink for a long time. He came to a jug, jug that is, that had a little water in the bottom of it. So the crow reached his beak inside the jug to get some of that water, but his beak couldn't quite touch the water. So what he did, he started picking up pebbles, one at a time, and dropping them into the jug. And as more and more pebbles accumulated in the bottom of the jug, the water rose in the, in the bottle until finally the old crow was able to drink all that he desired. These pebbles remind us of each of these items in the tabernacle. When we give the word of God a chance, open it, see what it says. When we gather them together with all these details, we can then drink of the water of life. To close, we, we see in the scriptures that the tabernacle of God has experienced two major changes so far and another one to come. From the tabernacle, it became the temple. From the er earthly temple, it came then to sit on every believer as it is written in 1 Corinthians. Your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. And then we're told that the physical temple, the one in heaven, enclosed in the new Jerusalem, which is heaven, says in John 21, it says, Then John, I, John, saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God. Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people. God himself will be with them and be their God. The question is, have you experienced the second change? when the Spirit says that actually comes and dwells with you. Today, you know, uh, I'm going to close with an offer of salvation. Perhaps for those who are listening uh, to this sermon and ask themselves about the place, their place in the tabernacle, the question is, where are you? Where are you? Are you outside or inside the holy place? Are you inside the holy place enjoying all the blessings of the bread and the light and the and the conversations with God. Or perhaps you are still outside contemplating at the outer covering, the ordinary one, and you want to get in to tabernacle. I, I will pray the prayer of salvation. It might be the most important prayer you've ever done. I will pray the prayer of salvation, which I believe will bring anyone from anywhere to come to the presence of God. This prayer recognizes that Yeshua, Jesus, is the Messiah. That he is the only way to God. He is the ticket, the password, which has allowed you to pass through the huge altar of sacrifice right in front of the presence of God. And as I pray this prayer, you can repeat after me. Or you can just say it in your mind. Yeshua, today I give you my life. Today I realize that your name means salvation and that you died for my sins for I am a sinner 
And I recognize that you are my Savior. Today, I give you my life. Thank you, Father, for sending your Son for me. I pray in his name. Amen and amen. And the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. If you pray this prayer, again, this is the most important. These are the most important words one can pronounce because it has to do with our eternal destiny. May the Lord bless you. Amen.